in listen only mode. Hi, and thank you for joining our webinar today where we will discuss detecting and responding to cyber breaches. So you will have the best practices uh, to know what to do in case uh, you realize there was uh, a hack in your system. Um, we're very happy to have two experts on the line today discussing this topic. Um, we have Alan Broken, the Chief Architect, Cybersecurity at Ascend Solutions, and we have Mickey Bresman, the CEO of Simparis. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you want to share it later with colleagues or you want to listen to a bunch of parts again, uh, we'll be sending you the link in just a few days. In addition, if you have any questions throughout the webinar that you would like our experts to answer, uh, please feel free to post them using the webinar question tool and we will get to them near the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Alan to start today's presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so welcome everyone. I just want to kind of, you know, when you signed up to this webinar, we had advertised some things here and so, you know, one of the big things that, that we want you to be able to know is that cyber attacks can get you too. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different ways that attackers get in, what they do and how they do it. And then uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, why are they doing what they're doing as well, not just the, the um, technicals of it, but, you know, what's their motivation. Uh, we'll talk about how to discover a breach quickly. Um, with the right tools and techniques in place, you can identify these things quickly. Um, and then if you weren't able to, to catch it and stop it, how do I recover? So if I didn't have the right tools in place, if things weren't, weren't working the way um, we're kind of suggesting up front, or if you're experiencing, you know, you're post-breach right now looking for some guidance, uh, we'll be talking about that as well. And so I think, I think I, go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, I just want to maybe ruin the spoiler kind of, but we will also be actually, well, you actually will be doing a live demo of an attack as it's happening. Yeah. Perfect. So with that in mind, um, one of the things to say here is, you know, you've seen the numbers. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think the, the challenge a lot of companies have, especially in their leadership, is, you know, we're just not very visible. We're not a company that, you know, we're not on the, the Fortune 50 or things like that. Why would people want to attack us? Um, another challenge is we've never had a breach. Um, I, at one point in time, uh, I did a lot of interviewing of CISOs, and it was very interesting to me the attitude difference between those CISOs who had experienced a breach and those who had not. Um, and so if you're thinking in those terms, we're, we're good because we haven't had a breach, that's not necessarily true. Um, the other thing is the probability is low, and that's just not a, that's not a factual thing. The probability of, of people um, breaking into your network can actually be very high. Uh, we worked, uh, Ascent worked with a uh, pen tester at one point uh, just a year ago that had said they had effectively owned every Active Directory they had attacked uh, since uh, 2011. Um, and so it, it can happen. It, it, it is probable. And then the fall, final thing is we're a small organization. And I think that's the really challenge, especially if you've been paying attention to kind of what's been going on uh, recently. Um, you know, everybody's potentially a target with all the ransomware bots and things of that nature out there. Um, I spent some time at the RSA conference this year, and ransomware was a big deal to every size of organization. So assuming that, that um, you can't be um, a target just because you're small isn't, isn't a very safe um, assumption. Uh, and then the last one is we have insurance. And that's the really challenging part is if you haven't been insured properly, you may not get the payout from your insurance if, if all the things are, are in place. But the other side of it is if you haven't shown that you've executed commercially reasonable controls, um, the insurance may not pay out. And, and especially uh, with the state of California now issuing, you know, what does commercially reasonable mean uh, from a, a legal standpoint, um, that's raised the bar kind of for everybody. Um, and it makes it easier for your insurer to not pay out. So with that in mind, I think the other thing is the real personal effect here. You know, the directors uh, at Target were directly sued for the cyber breach. And it was, you know, within not much more than 30 days of the actual breach occurring uh, did these, these derivative lawsuits come out. And so there's a, there's a direct um, sort of personal cost in some cases, uh, whether it's your job, whether it's, it's a lawsuit, you know, not taking care of these things is pretty critical. So when we think about the modern threat landscape, one of the big things to consider is, is who are, you know, who are the attackers and what are they all about? And, and I think, you know, historically, 
we've had a lot of stuff from the movies of the kind of lone individual who's out there, uh, you know, look at me kind of thing. And, and you go back to the 90s when computing was still in it, you know, the Internet was in its infancy. We saw a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, but the reality of the situation is there's lots of people out there trying to get at data for different reasons. And so one of the questions you've got to ask yourself uh, when developing your protection strategy is what is my data that, that matters? What is it that um, uh, people, you know, may come after? You know, is it something where because of the industry I'm in, there are hacktivists out there attacking me because they think that will somehow change business processes or the products we sell or things of like that? Um, in some cases, uh, you're just a good financial target, and it might not be what you think. I worked with a telecommunications company at one point, um, and organized crime was after them to drop ship equipment. So they were breaking into the IT systems not to steal the data, but to manipulate their system to cause um, equipment to be shipped places where then they could resell that stolen equipment. Um, we've got other things where it's an unethical competitor. Um, I think, you know, depending on where you where you live in the world, this, this is a... Uh, more of a novel idea. Um, and this goes down to if I'm your competitor and I can find your price list uh, and then go and actually undercut you by a dollar or a penny or whatever to, to steal your business away, um, in some places in the world that's considered good business practice. Um, and so we, there are documented cases of uh, companies being put out of business because the bad guys got access to their, um, their pay data. You know, what, what it was their customers were paying for um, things or what their wholesalers were selling to them and then using that against them. Um, and, and then today we have terrorist organizations and, it, you know, out there trying to overcome whatever it is um, and use that to that, use their ability to manipulate your system for their, their benefit. Um, and then finally, this nation state type attack. Um, we think about that um, you know, with the attribution of the, the Sony attacks to, to North Korea and other things out there, um, this is a very real threat. So there's a lot of different people that have a lot of different reasons to get at your data. And that's one of the things you have to ask yourself is the data we have or the systems we run, is there something someone else can financially or, you know, politically gain by taking, taking control of it? And so when we think about the world overall, um, you know, every industry is under attack. And so these, these numbers are from uh, the Verizon data that were showing, you know, in financial services, there were an average of 350 malware events a week um, in financial services networks versus 575 in insurance, 772 in utilities, and all the way up to 801 in retail. And, and one of the things that, that I find interesting about this, having worked in all of these sectors, is that um, there's a level of focus on information security in financial services that's higher than it is in, say, utilities or retail, and therefore the bad guys are less successful. And so part of the reason you see such a higher attack rate in retail is it's more, it's more lucrative for the bad guys. If they can, if they can actually um, break into your system, it's worth spending time on, where if it's harder to break into, they're going to go someplace else. And so that's what I think is really interesting is there's technically kind of more money available inside the financial services, but they're also better defended so the bad guys are going to the next best thing, which would be retail or utilities. Um, the other thing to note, though, is that companies are being directly targeted. And so by this we mean um, essentially 70 to 90 percent of malware samples are unique to an organization. So when, when you start to look at the malware that's on the network, um, 70 to 90 percent has been specifically crafted to go after the company that's there. And so we see a lot of, at least lately, I see a lot of spear phishing emails that look like legitimate emails from the CEO or the CFO or someone in, in leadership at, at the company. And it's, it's very targeted and it's very intentional. So, you know, when you think about it from a probability perspective, if you're currently in retail or utilities, there's a high probability that you have targeted malware coming directly after you. And then from there, what the bad guys are trying to do in the end is compromise credentials, that, that if they can get to legitimate credentials of a, a, a administrator or someone with privilege in the organization, um, they can use those legitimate credentials to move around and do things. And so, you know, from a, an attack perspective, the, uh, um, when you look at what's in the malware itself, 10% are spyware keyloggers. Well, if, if I'm just using username password for my administrator, uh, access. Um, I've got I've got admin access there in in this quadrant. Uh, RAM scrapers are pulling things out of memory. So you know if you if you've got various uh, credentials in memory, that's another thing they can go after. 
Phishing obviously is what it sounds like. If I'm gonna, if I can get you to log in somewhere, it's maybe a little harder to get someone to log into a random website with their admin credentials. Uh, but finally, there's specific attacks against credentials, and so these are things like the pass the hash and pass the ticket attacks you may have heard about other places. The bottom line here is, if you really look at this, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If if you have data of any kind, or if you're seen to be a potential target where they can get money out of you. Uh, you can expect that there will be targeted malware against your organization going after credentials. And so what does this, this look like in, you know, in reality? Um, so one of the big things that happened is one, once you've got the compromised credentials, the vast majority of major attacks use this in some way, shape, or form. And so if you dig into the newspaper-worthy attacks that are out there, compromised credentials were actually part of it. You know, one of the big things about it is they can use uh, legitimate IT tools to do what they're doing rather than, than um, using malware. And so the malware gets them in the front door, but once they've actually got these high-end credentials, they can set up um, things inside your environment to establish long-term dominance. And that's what I'm actually going to focus on here is not necessarily the various attack tools themselves because there, there's a, a plethora of them. There's kind of old school tools like the Windows Credential Editor and, and newer things like uh, PowerSploit and, and Metasploit and some of the other tools out there um, that can do these kind of things. And there's really sophisticated things like Bloodhound that will go out and, and read your whole network to bring these back. But the whole reason they're going after the credentials is then they can reuse them and they look like they're doing legitimate things. Um, the other thing is that bad guys are staying in your network on the average of eight, eight months before they're detected. Now, this number keeps going down year over year. A few years ago, it was 12 to 14 months. Um, it's down to eight, but it'd be a lot better if it was less than that. Um, and then finally, you know, there's a, a huge financial loss, brand, brand reputation loss, and, and potentially executive jobs. I think the other thing is in this era of ransomware, you know, there's, there's cases now where bad guys have gotten in, compromised uh, various systems, and now, you know, locked uh, a hotel out of all of their rooms, where, you know, if you were in the room, you could get, you could get out, but you couldn't get in because they, they've used it to do that. So there's a lot of different damage that can be done once they've got the credentials. So when we think about what this really looks like and what, what you kind of need to be defending against or what you need to be looking for, I think the first thing you've got to realize is the bad guys are going to find out about your organization. You know, they, for, if for whatever reason in your industry you have data they want, uh, the first thing they're going to do is they're just going to start to, to use search engines to find out about your company. And as they find out about your company, they're going to find out about people in the company. Uh, they use that information to, to target social networks and find linkages between people in social networks in the company, as well as job sites. There's a lot of interesting things that the bad guys can find out about your organization based on who you're hiring um, to determine exactly how the, they're, they're going to go out about attacking you. And eventually they can build a profile of people in the company. And based on that profile, they can then target individuals. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people misunderstand is that you know, if you're really under some kind of targeted attack, the bad guys know who the sysadmins are. They know that you're, you know, an administrator of Active Directory or an administrator of SQL, those kind of things, because they've done their homework. Um, from then, they're going to do this specific malware. Like I said a couple slides ago, you know, 70 to 90 percent of malware is targeted at the organization. Um, and so spear phishing is common, but there are also these watering hole attacks. And so I can remember a while back, I went to a pretty standard website that, um, uh, admins post thing, you know, like a forum site. And it, basically one of the pieces of advertising in the website had malware in it that kicked off my malware detection. Um, but they look for those kind of things. Um, I worked for a customer that uh, there was a particular financial services um, website that a lot of people had trafficked and the bad guys had injected things into the ad stream there. And so the watering hole attacks are also pretty targeted. But the other interesting one is media. And so the bad guys will go around and actually drop you know, you think this is only in the movies, only something you might see in Mr. Robot, but, but it's actually for real. Um, that if you drop thumb drives around, um, industry statistics show that about 40% uh, of thumb drives just dropped on a company's campus will be picked up and plugged into machines in the environment. So once the attacker's actually gotten somebody to do the wrong thing here, um, then they can go on and, and move from there into their machine. Right, So they get you to, to click on that link that's spear phishing or plug in the media, and now their machine is messed up and not acting correctly. And so what's the first thing that happens? Well, they're going to call a workstation admin and say, hey, my workstation's not working. And so more often than not, the admin logs in with the same credentials they log into everything, 
And once they've done that, the bad guy has compromised their credentials, and now they're using those credentials to move around in the network. And so as they move around in the network, eventually they find somebody in an Active Directory environment with domain admin um, credentials, and they use those then to go compromise Active Directory. And so once they've gotten that far, you know, they've compromised all these set of endpoints, then they want to really establish their dominance inside Active Directory so that, that even if you think you've cleaned them out, you haven't. Um, and from there, they use that to find key groups in Active Directory to then go and actually breach the organization. And so this, this attack is um, uh, pretty common in, in the sort of pass the hash or pass the ticket scenario. Um, and there's a lot of guidance from Microsoft out on this type of attack and how it works and how to defend against it. But I think the important part of this is once, once Active Directory has been breached in this manner, it can be really hard to figure out, A, in what way was it breached? That is, where are all the places the bad guy has, has sort of taken over my environment? And then B, uh, what do I do to clean up after it? And so I'm going to move over here to uh, kind of walk through uh, post, uh, sort of post, post initial infection domain dominance attack. And while I do that, Mickey, did you have any comments on the um, initial part there? Any, any notes from the field yourself while I get this demo set up? Uh, yeah, um, one of the things that you've mentioned there, and, and I guess this is something which is in the news, um, regarding the disk on keys that are being uh, spread around, just recently we heard in the news about one of the manufacturers of storage suppliers that actually was providing a, a disk on key which turned out to be affected with the malware. Um, so basically I guess that the assumption that you can be protected. Think about it. If somebody is now implementing a storage solution in your environment, he's already probably using um, privileged account in order to do that. And now he, he have been just infected with the malware. So it's just as an example. And another thing, just as also as you mentioned, just to add over it, we are far, far away from the days of what used to be script kiddies. Those are no longer the, the kinds of threats that we are facing with. It's more and more common when you actually see attacks that are either targeted specifically to uh, an organization or in some cases just what we've seen uh, during the last two weeks with the WannaCry attack where, as you mentioned, the damage can be crucial. Um, as, as you mentioned, the hotels as an example. Another example was that, and, and we saw it with some of our customers actually in the UK, where hospitals were shutting down uh, because of that attack. Yeah, and so I, I think one of the big things that going back to this kind of overall thing is that that assertion of dominance of your environment. How do you how do you figure out where they're at? So I want to tell you just a little bit about my environment before I go actually kind of attack it and, and show you the, the outcome of that attack. But effectively in this kind of sample environment, we followed some of Microsoft's best practices, right? We have this this tiered set of OUs that have a very small number of users in them. Um, a couple of different groups here for administration. And so in, in my environment, I have this particular group that's just for SQL admins, so people that are supposed to administer SQL. I also have this other group called actual domain admins. And so that way I know if I go over here to my um, normal domain admins group that, you know, there shouldn't be anybody in this group, right? that the only thing in there is my break glass account and this actual domain admins group. And so I, I watch this and I monitor this group so that if the bad guy got in somehow and added themselves directly to here, there'd be alerts that go off. Likewise, up here, I, I, I'm kind of monitoring this group too. I know where, where my, my privileged user should be. So I've done some good hygiene to start out with. Uh, but still, I can make a mistake. And so, you know, I. I, I know that maybe nobody on this call has ever done it, but have you ever been in that situation where to troubleshoot something, you've put some account in domain admins, quote, temporarily? Um, and that's kind of the scenario here. You've got this account that maybe shouldn't have been in there normally, but for troubleshooting or other purposes, you've done that. And so in my environment, because I had this account out there, I now have a workstation um, where that account, that account was used, and I made the bad guy, but the bad guy had already, already compromised that workstation kind of like the, the kill chain that we talked about. So now that they've done that, let me get to my malware. Uh, they're going to run some malware. And so if I run this, this uh, PowerShell-based malware, and that's the other thing to note, something like 40% of malware that's found these days 
has PowerShell in it or is using PowerShell as its thing. So I've written this power, um, this malware myself. Um, and so it's not the most elegant piece of malware in the world, but I'm going to run this as an administrator. Um, I am going to let it run because I didn't sign it. The bad guys are getting better about signing their code as well. So because they've com compromised this remote registry account on this machine, they're able to go out and actually map a drive to the domain controller and then copy malware to the domain controller. So part of the scenario in this is, is um, their ability to reach out and touch the domain controller and then load um, uh, software on there. And so now they've created a backdoor SQL service account. So part of the scenario from a domain dominance perspective is that ability to go create other accounts or other things in Active Directory that aren't obvious and then um, add that account in to places you might see. So at this point, um, I don't have a lot of SQL servers for them to compromise. So effectively what's happened is they've gone out and they've created this, this fake service account that looks like other service accounts in the environment um, and then gone and put it into the SQL admins account because sometimes that happens. Sometimes you put the service account in there while you're troubleshooting something, you forget to take it out. It doesn't look like it's that big of a deal uh, on the surface. But the other thing the bad guy's going to do in this scenario is um, after they've done their, their badness with the group, they're going to go remove that um, and so uh, and then clean up their evidence. So they, they go and, and um, cleaned out all the things they put on the domain controller and cleaned that out. So if I go look now back at my domain controller, um, I don't have any actual in this, this SQL admins group, assuming my, my code worked correctly, it's empty. So while the script ran and they did their bad stuff to SQL, um, this user was a member of this group, but now it's not. So how would I know? Um, and that's really the tricky part here is the bad guy does a really good job of hiding what they're able to do. The other thing is they didn't manipulate these two groups that I was actually really paying attention to. So this actual domain admins group, membership didn't change there. The, um, in the user's container, the domain admins group, users didn't change there. So I don't really know that they've taken over things, but the other thing they did in this process is they've gone and um, in, in users, there's now a new SQL, uh, there's a SQL service account that was created. And then up here in the actual, um, uh, on this group, there's actually some security that's been changed. And so if I notice, I have these, uh, I've been given ACLs to these SQL service, fake SQL service accounts. I've run this a few times and not really cleaned it up. But the fact of the matter is, would I know as a normal admin trying to debug my environment to go look at every single admin group and see who was now had full control of those groups? It's not kind of a normal thing I would look for, but now that they've created this fake account and have it kind of embedded in there where you don't realize it's there, um, they've now given it access to the SQL what SQL admins have access to, access to and can go get whatever data they want. And so it's a pretty tricky hidden kind of thing. So if I'm going to figure this kind of thing out and kind of audit for it, I really need a good tool set for that. So what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to move over to the Sempiris, um uh, solution. I guess, Mickey, before I go into kind of walking through that specific scenario, do you have anything you'd like to add to the, you know, the um, scenario here? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, this is a very interesting example, which is going beyond the standard things, um, which sometimes surprised me when even we have the conversation with the CISOs, and you kind of ask them, how do you monitor what's going on in terms of the permissions in your environment? And the most common answer that you get is that we track who is a member of which group. And that is kind of just as what you did now. The next question would be, but how do you know if somebody is now being granted the same kind of permissions as the domain admin or as any other privileged account, and there are a bunch of those in the AD, but it was not part of any group. It was simply added as an echo. And in most of the cases, that, that's where things starting to be interesting, and in most of the cases, people don't really know how to deal with that scenario. Right, and so that's really the thing that, that I, to be honest, I got kind of excited about Semperis as a tool because um, Having worked with a lot of customers in this scenario, I'm very familiar with what the bad guys can do to hide themselves inside your directory. Either with this kind of trick where they've gone and they put ACLs very specifically on very specific objects. You know, it, it, it didn't go on the NOU structure where you might look. It went to very specific objects that said, you know what, this group, SQL admins, has a lot of power in the organization. 
So if I can if I can own permissions to that group and be able to create accounts different places and, and put them in and out of it, I could go along undetected for a long time. And it's that kind of sneakiness that leads to this sort of eight month kind of thing. But if we look here at the actual Sempiris console where we're actually getting all the changed items, we've got a couple of interesting things here. One of them is we're seeing both the group membership changes. So if I look at this group SQL admins, um, I'm seeing that this member, and it's this new SQL account we, we created, um, is being added. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I know who changed it. And I think that's one of the big differentiators is um, if I realize that this account, Remote Reg, has been compromised, I can now search for the, through this database to see what did Remote Reg do since it's been compromised. Like, or even go back to see where it's had um, you know, a change in behavior overall that puts us in a position where we know that Remote Reg is doing bad things and what all are they. In addition to that, we've got the um, NT security descriptor here where effectively the, um, I see that an actual change to the ACL has happened. And so that tells me I need to go look at this SQL admins group and see what the permissions are on it um, and fix that as one of the things I want to fix. And so um, from a uh, setup perspective, I, I get a, I've actually run this script quite a bit today. And so I've got a lot of other um, entries in here. But the main thing is this thing that I just ran in the last few minutes, it's gone out and all of the activities the script did where it created the account, it added memberships to groups, it removed memberships from groups and changed this, the security descriptor are all listed here um, in this setup. So, so I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would probably add like a few small things. One, I would add the fact that in, in many organizations what we see today, they usually have a provisioning system in place. So in reality, you would kind of expect that nobody would be added to groups outside of that provisioning system. And this is actually something that we always recommend customers to do. If, if you will go to the advanced search that we provide here, then what you'll be able to do, you'll be able to say, well, show me everything that was created, um, meaning, for example, all the changes that were introduced to ED by a specific user. And then if something was done by not, not by that user, you can figure out that there is something wrong there. And what I think what you're, what you're about to show now is, is actually the ability to search for the anti-security. That's also that you can, you can look by any attribute, which sometimes is helpful. Or you can do it exactly as you do now by just typing the user there. Um, so there are different ways that how you can present this information because your environment is, of course, relatively small because it's a lab environment, but keep in mind that in most of the organizations, we are seeing tens of thousands of changes a day, which is also something which people sometimes don't really um, think about. But Active Directory, even in the not extremely large organizations, are going through a lot of daily changes. You are adding people to groups. You are modifying DNS records. Um, Sometimes you will see certain attribute in, in on the users is being modified. Um, sometimes it's even every 10 minutes. So it, it usually will kind of be overwhelming, I would say. You would, you would get tons of, of information. And you now need to be able to very quickly go through it. And then probably as what you're about to show next is, OK, yeah, so we found it. Now we want to react. What do we do? Right. And so in this case, you know, the only things that are permanent here are these two ac actions. I can undo them, which will get rid of that user account um, and also um, any, any references to that security descriptor that was changed. So I'm not leaving a hanging SID reference there on, on the security descriptor. Um, and, and so that's the other nice thing about this is once you've done the investigation and figured out that you were um, uh, this account during this period of time had done a bunch of bad stuff, you can actually revert it as, you know, as simply as that by checking the undo button. So that's really kind of the core, you know, this ability to detect changes down to the ACL level in real time based on who did them. And I think the who did them is one of the big differentiators here. Um, and then undo them is a great way to mitigate some of these domain dominance type attacks. But uh, so before I move on to kind of the next type of scenario, was there anything else you wanted to highlight, Mickey? Yeah, I would also uh, would like to highlight maybe the, the way that, as you mentioned uh, before, the, the average period of time that an attacker stays inside organization um, 
today is over six months and it used to be even much more than that. And one of the reasons to that is because of the way that today we are trying to combat those uh, events and that's actually by looking at the events themselves, meaning we are trying to catch up events as they happen. But as we all know, one of the things that attackers can do, they can actually stop the, the, the uh, events from being collected. So for example, I can go ahead and I can stop the service of the agent that is currently running on the DC. And as you guys probably know, everything that has to do with the security context of the events in Active Directory is not being replicated and needs to be collected from the DC itself. So the question becomes, if we now stopped as, uh, an, uh, the agent from running and we did a bunch of changes and then we returned the agent back to the running state, how would we know that anything even happened in the environment? So the agent was down for less than two minutes, which all that we needed in order to execute all the scripts. Now we will be completely blind to it forever. That's basically where we are. So the only way to overcome something like that is actually to collect the events from the Active Directory itself. What I mean by that is that if you are now not just looking on the events that are happening, but you're actually looking on what's going on in the Active Directory environment, that's the only way for you to know exactly what's going on. And we refer to that as state comparison, meaning what we would like to see, we would like to see if something actually happened in the Active Directory because you can be either part of the group or not part of the group. You can have your echo modified or not modified. There is nothing in between. So if any change happened in the Active Directory, which is not consistent with the latest state that we have, then you know that something is going on and you probably want to go ahead and, and investigate what that certain thing is. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's one of the big differentiators here as well is um, you know, the bad guys do have the ability to reach out and touch and get into your domain controllers and cause all kinds of havoc of different types. Um, and so the ability to, to monitor the state in addition to what's just coming out of the logs is a great, um, uh, is a great adjunct that makes things work really well uh, from a, a, a defense perspective. Um, I think the other thing, let me go here. Um, the other thing, though, that I think is from a... Um, you know, to, to be considered is, and we just kind of talked about that, is the ransomware scenario. And so while we talk quite a bit about ransomware in the sense of documents, I think most people think of ransomware as, as a document kind of thing where um, I've locked up the file shares on the network or I've locked up a specific uh, document store. Um, ransomware can take a lot of different, different takes. Um, you know, one of them I mentioned earlier was this idea of locking up your, your hotel room so people can't get into them. Uh, but other scenarios have been like locking the company out of all of its uh, uh, AWS resources, like being able to basically take control of the core environment in a sort of horrible way and, and then use that to, to execute a ransom. So in this kind of domain dominance scenario, we're in this position where we've got sort of similar, similar types of attacks that could be done against Active Directory. Um, and so I'm going to run another little bit of malware here using those same sort of stolen credentials from before. And so as I do this, again, I'm going to kind of do the same type of attack where I go out, use my stolen credentials, and get into the uh, uh, domain controller. Uh, I'm going to copy malware to the domain controller again. Um, we've seen that happen before. But this time I'm actually going to stop the Active Directory uh, database services. Um, and so those are things like DNS and... Um, uh, the um, thing, and then I'm going to copy my DIT file to an exfiltration site. After that, I'm going to encrypt it so that now I've got a I've got a an encrypted version of your ntds.dit on the service, um, and you you and now I delete the proper one. So now, from a ransom perspective, you're kind of stuck. Your your Active Directory is now pretty much dead on arrival, not available to you unless uh, if you can execute this attack against multiple DCs at the same time, which is actually not that hard to orchestrate with kind of modern PowerShell, um, I, I can now put, put an organization in a position where their whole AD database is, is encrypted and um, in the hands of the bad guy, and now you got to pay up or you don't, um, you, know, you don't have access anymore. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, one of the things here is just figuring out, do we pay or not pay, or do I have something... Um, some kind of tooling available to me that would help me bring this back from this kind of horrible end. 
Um, and so that's what I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Mickey to talk about, you know, how to avoid having to pay the ransom in this kind of scenario. Thank you. I will just, um, I will just start uh, by maybe um, adding um, at some additional scenarios to what you've just described. Um, but first, let me just quickly connect to the environment. Yeah, Maytal, can you transfer the screen? Are we showing my screen now? Um, Mickey, I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to add to the to the uh, the scenario that was described by by Alan that um, there are of course other ways where you can completely destroy the Active Directory, but not going even after the did file. If you have the AD dom uh, uh, domain admin, then and then they don't usually show it in presentations so that nobody will get ideas. But it's very simple to take down the entire AD environment by using the standard tools. Um, you just four clicks away from completely destroying the environment beyond any way to repair it. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Another thing which we also have seen with customers which usually do not go public that much is that some of the attacks are not, specifically if the attack was going for you specifically, then in some of the cases you will actually see an attack that is not trying to encrypt your environment, it is not trying to get you to pay uh, ransomware. Actually what they will be doing, their only purpose is to take your environment completely out and just shut down the organization for as long as they can. And what better way to do it by just taking out the Active Directory because that would mean that the entire organization have stopped. Um, so what we want to do in this environment, in this scenario, so let's assume for example that it is a ransomware attack and just as going from where Alan left it, we have just been presented with somebody asking us to pay them money in order to get our environment back up and running. And the difference is that we don't really know what happened, meaning we do since Alan showed us, but in reality you don't know what they did, how they did it, what kind of access do they have, um, what can else do they do in, in our environment. Um, so you kind of want to start in doing your forensics, but with that said you don't want to waste time on it. Basically you want to get your organization up and running as, as fast as possible. So what you would want to do in such a scenario, you will first of all, you would want to take a, a complete backup um, of your environment and you would want to have everything as much automated as possible. So for the first thing that um, we, I would do here is, is go uh, to the back now, backup now so, uh, solution um, and I'm not going to run it just to save us the time but basically what the solution will do and, and I did it just before the demo, it will ex actually go ahead and backup the domain control, the different domain controllers in my environment. So it's already a pre-configured rule that basically takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes to backup all the DCs in my environment. And the way that the system is built is, is that it doesn't really matter how big is your environment, meaning how many domain controllers do you have. You might uh, decide that you, want to, you, you don't want to back up all of them, uh, but if you, even if you decide that you do want to back them all, it's all being done in the same time. So you can kind of just run the backup now, and that will back up all of the domain controls in your environment, everything will be saved in the um, specific location that you described. We you refer to those as distribution points where you can actually define that certain backups are going to specific places in, the, in your environment. Usually it's used for uh, geolocation distribution for example. And now since we have the backup of, my, of the environment, which is of course not a backup that we would use to recover because we know that this is not a, a good backup, but what we would like to do now, we would like to save this backup aside and we would actually like to execute a recovery process, but we would probably want to use a backup from at least a day or two ago, maybe even more, depends on what is it that we suspect that is happening to us. And in this case you want to have as much fully automated disaster recovery solution in place and since in the attack that Alan have just executed upon us, um, we have the entire AD shut down, then recovering one of the DCs or one of the um, 
domains, well, actually, in this specific case, if we were to recover all of the disease, that probably should be fine. But again, I don't really know what happened. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually recover the entire forest, because my assumption is going to be that in addition to the fact that the bad guys have encrypted the NTDS file, they have actually played with my AD itself, and perhaps they have removed all the domain, uh, domain admins that I have been familiar with and created some backdoors for themselves. So I actually want to revert this thing, and in my case, I'm going to take it, um, let's say, two days ago, which I think is enough. Um, and then what the system will do, it will actually go ahead and bring all the information in terms of how this environment uh, looks like, in terms of what do we have on the backup. As soon as I will hit the Analyze button, what the system will do now, it will go ahead and it will take a look on the, um, on the backups that we have, and it will compare the, the last known good state um, to what we currently have in the production environment. It will also compare the backup that we have, um, and we refer to those as backup sets, because we will be taking information in terms of how your AD used to look like when it was operational, uh, metadata, and things like DNS settings, fees morals, so everything that you need to know in order to recover the environment. And what I'll be able to do that way is basically recover the entire environment. Well, of course, the system is going to make sure that that's exactly what I meant, because I'm about to take my entire forest back in time. And from that point on, and we can maybe look at some on, on the logs just to show you what's going on, but what's going to happen in this environment is that we will start the entire process of restorations from backup. We will overrun the current uh, system state, which is, of course, not something that we're about to trust. And then the system will re-promote some of the domain controllers after we are done with the restoration process. If some of the domain controllers are unaccessible and, and they have been removed from the network, for example, then the system will do the metadata cleanup uh, by itself. So it, it will, in a fully automated way, it will restore the entire environment back to the point in time that we wanted it to be. Now, this will probably take approximately 30 minutes to recover the entire forest, and of course we are not going to wait, but I think you kind of understand where this thing is going to. Now, the only thing that I will add here before returning this to Ellen is that the backup that I've just taken before I ran the execution of the forest restoration, I can now take a site to a lab environment and by using, again, the, the St. Paris Forest Recovery Solution, I can now recover it in that uh, state in an isolated environment and start to doing my forensics to try to figure out what happened, how I got hit, and what do I do next about it. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ellen. Okay, let me know when my, there we go, show my screen. Okay, so, let, let's say that, that you're in this situation where you really didn't have these kind of tools in place and now you need to regain control, right? So, so you have been breached or maybe that's the situation you're in today and why you're you know, on this call. So let's talk a little bit about how you can effectively regain control and how uh, some of these tools might help in that scenario. So I think the big thing you've got to consider is the clean source principle. And so Microsoft has done a really good job from an Active Directory or Windows perspective of saying, you know, what, how, how do I know that, that I'm, I'm in control and I can assert control that, yes, I own my environment? And so there's this object, there's this idea of there's a subject, a control relationship, and an object. And so um, there, these are transitive in the sense of if I've got something that's got uh, – if I have direct from A, I have direct control to B, and from B, I have direct control to C, A has indirect control of C. So if I think about it like installation media, what I got to install my OS, um, has direct control of the um, OS because I use the media to install the OS. But if the attacker can impact my installation media, so my in install media has been violated, um, then they gain in, in, indirect control of my OS unless I figure out that, they, that it's been violated and cleaned up. And so we've seen cases of this where um, there were actually um, servers shipped with bad firmware. Um, and so after the OS was loaded, the firmware took over and infected the, the, the OS and then started to take control of the, the operating system. And so a, a big part of what you've got to do to move forward is this idea of clean source where as you're rebuilding and reasserting control, 
that you're doing so from a very um, tight place where you can you can attest to these are the changes I made and I know that I made them and I know who made them so that you can see what those control relationships look like. Um, so I think the big thing um, you've got to take away from this is, um, you know, in most cases people are focused on res restoring service first um, and dealing with this root cause later. And I think that that was one thing that, that Mickey did a good job of is showing how to take a quick backup of the, the information and to, or to use the backups to create something in another environment um, for forensics or law enforcement or whatever you need to, to kind of be whole there. But at the same thing, um, you know, trying to get your services back online because availability is much of an issue as the integrity and confidentiality. Uh, if the, the type of outages, I've, I've destroyed Active Directory. Um, the other thing is you need to work to isolate the services to prevent further infection. So if you can figure out what the vector is, you know, adding firewalls, adding controls, um, adding additional layers of uh, auditing and logging to see what's going on are a great thing. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's really important is this take-back event. It's this idea of at a certain day, at a certain time, you're actually going to go in and all of the corrupted ACLs, all the corrupted groups, all the things where you're not sure if the admin account is clean, you're going to do that. And so you've got to plan for that very well so that you're not in a position where you do this big take-back thing and you really haven't taken back your environment. Um, I'm aware of a customer that the way they planned for their take back was there was a physical like paper form that had to be passed around um, in order for uh, people to get their admin rights reasserted in the new environment. But they let the form get out an email in a way that the bad guys found it and filled out the form themselves. So you've got to make sure that when you're planning for this take back event, you're also using really good uh, communication security so that only the right people are knowing what's on. The other thing is building your replacement services with a clean source. So that's not just um, that I know that I, I built my server and the workstations and whatnot from a very clean known source, but I'm also using good audit and logging services throughout that I can prove that during the build process we didn't actually get anything compromised, that, that what we implement is what we meant to implement and that can be audited. Um, and then the last part is just making sure that you coordinate with your business units on that take back event that typically there's some disruption that happens during that so that they're aware of when it's happening and that you've, you've kind of accounted for that. Um, from a practical perspective, one of the things you've got to assume is that your enterprise communication and collaboration channels are compromised. That, that during, during this kind of enterprise take back scenario, the bad guys probably have some access to your email accounts, some access to possibly phone systems or things like that. And so getting yourself out of band of those normal communication channels is really important. Um, the other thing is, uh, is this lack of insight. So um, in a lot of cases, you're bringing, you may be bringing in a third party to help you, but if you don't have good um, knowledge of what accounts are really the real accounts that matter, what accounts are doing the right things, um, you know, what's my network topology, things like that, the, the people trying to help you do your response and recovery um, are kind of hamstrung because they don't they only know what you know and if you don't have good insight into your overall environment and how it's supposed to work or how it normally works um, that can be a real challenge um, and so when we think about reasserting control um, and especially with this kind of some scenario one of the really nice things about bringing in some pair say after the fact if you didn't have it in place up front is that ability to come in on day one and go, okay, post breach and go, okay, these are the people that are supposed to be admins or SQL admins. And if I run that same, if the bad guy is able to, um, you know, we missed that ACL. So, so in our um, attack demonstration I showed earlier, if in my cleanup activities I happen to miss um, this SQL admins, um, you know, ACL on here where, where uh, you know, SQL Service 77 is a, has full control of this admin group. If I miss that in my initial cleanup operations, with something like Semperis in place, if the bad guy then comes along and, and you know, temporarily adds that account, because they've still got a workstation or something in the environment where they can add that back in, um, whoops. One second. I'm going to flip the, it's SVC SQL. Sorry about that. Um, uh, 
that gets added in with some Ferris in play, I can actually see that that the um, that change has occurred. And so even if the bad guy did manage to hide something from your initial triage and figuring it out, eventually you're going to see that the um, group membership was changed and that, that it's been added um, along the way. So there, there that that is from a ensuring your clean source and ensuring your system has been you, you, set up you want, after the fact. Yeah, you just want to click the search button to refresh. Yeah, there we right. go. Yep. Yeah, and you can see we, we've added this account to the list. Now, granted, I used the, the normal admin account to do that, but if I, if I had been logged in as this SQL account, I would have been able to do the same thing, and, and that would have shown up here, and now we would have found the account in the environment that um, was compromised. So, Mickey, did you have any other things along those lines you'd like to share? Um, no, I think that, that we kind of covered most of the things that we wanted. Um, I guess we can open up to questions. Metal? So, Mickey, at this point, I think this presentation was uh, amazingly clear and uh, nobody has any questions, but um, Alan, if I could ask you to go back to the uh, PowerPoint and share the question slide where we showed uh, your email and Mickey's email, um, that would be awesome because then people, if they remember anything going forward, they could always uh, just shoot I will do either that. of you. Awesome. <laughs> and um, so... Just to conclude everything, and thank you everybody for the overwhelming attention here. I could see that everybody is so super focused on the presentation. Um, uh, please feel free to take down Alan's email, Mickey's email, and if you have any questions going forward, uh, please don't hesitate to shoot us an email, and we'll be happy to provide you with answers for all your specific questions. Um, Mickey, Alan, thank you for this amazing presentation. Do you have anything to add? No, thanks everybody for your time, and and uh, I, I hope you're just not in the situation where you need to respond to a breach in this way. But um, I hope now that you've seen, you know, some of the things the bad guys can do, you can prepare better for it and defend yourself in a more cohesive way. And I just want to say thank you to Alan for the amazing presentation of the real attack that he's just done here. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone.